Okay, welcome to my at-home shooting clinic. Uh, full disclosure, Brandon and I originally, we had this idea, or I had an idea that I wanted to make this, this whole shooting clinic, this huge production. I wanted to, we, 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 I even had Brandon over for chicken parm, which Brandon's one of the few people that have got, gotten to have my wife's famous chicken parm. But we had this whole thing lined out or, or lined up and and then as time went on, trying to get the gym time and, and everything right, then I, I just figured with what can be taught here and what I'm going to teach within this brief little amount of time that we're together, I think I want the information to stand out more than I want the production of it to stand out. Not to say, Brandon, that your production's not amazing, but I want my words and then little actions that we're going to do here to be really the star of the show and to help whoever you are watching this, um, further your, your shooting journey, right? That's, 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 that's my big goal. I've always said from the beginning, I want to teach the world how to shoot. And I don't want there to be any barrier that allows somebody from wherever not to be able to get the information that I'm going to provide today. So I just want you to have it. I'm hoping that maybe it sparks something in you, whether you're a player, a coach, a parent, Maybe this is what kind of brings a whole bunch of different ideas together for you and allows you to, you know, progress on your journey. And who knows? I, I tell each group of kids that I get in front of, look, it, it really does not matter how strong you are, fast you are, strong you are. Or I think I already said strong you are. But with that being said, boy, girl, anybody can do it. So anybody can become a great shooter. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, even with what I'm going to present, it's not tons of information. Right. But I have a really, really good friend that sends me books and he'll send a book and he'll send the title. And then right next to the title, he'll just say day to read lifetime to master. And those turn out to be my favorite books. And I find myself reading them again and again and again. And shooting truly is that mastery on any level is that it's this constant evolution. You're never really done with it. And you'll discover even through the most simple things. You could do it for a hundred straight days on, and on day 101, something clicks like it's never clicked before. And that's what, that's what I'm hoping that, that, that this can do. Hopefully it inspires somebody. I also feel like this is my way of giving back to the countless teachers that have put stuff out for free on YouTube, on Instagram, on all these different platforms that allowed me to start piecing together kind of my methodology in shooting, allowed me to find the people that have, had, have been so influential on in my life in terms of teaching, uh, particularly, I mean, my college coach, uh, basketball hall of famer, Herb McGee, and then, you know, a guy I consider a really, really good friend of mine and my mentor, Rob Fodor, that, uh, that have really opened my eyes to, to new things. So I remember sitting at my cubicle thinking, um, I know there's more to shooting. There's, there's definitely more to it. I got to figure out and I'm trying, I was trying to piece together information from all these sources. And what I want to do with this is to just have one source. Uh, if you really want to learn it, I, I truly believe that what, what we're going to do here is, is enough to get you started on the journey and, and get you down that path of, of understanding. It's not drill related. It's not drill heavy. I would like to get to a point in my career where I don't do drills. I just want to be able to communicate with my words. Obviously, I think showing things can be super helpful. Drills are meant to make athletes feel or players feel a certain thing. But with, if we can explain it the right way and simplify things the right way, I think we can start to get away from that more and more. I'm not saying that I'll never do drills, but the, 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 the whole goal for me would eventually get to the point where I don't have to do them and I'm not pushing them. Uh, it's, it's the understanding. It's the why that's really going to push us forward at the end of the day. If you're just, if you're just looking for the drills, you're missing such a, a big component of it. All right. So got that out of the way. And to start, I'm just going to cover over some really, really small, just cover some small details just because they're very common shooting questions, but they're not, to me, the, the biggest piece of the puzzle. And I think that they can, be, they, they, can be, they can be taught rather quickly, or at least the ideology behind it can be taught rather quickly. Um, when it comes to gripping the basketball, 
ultimately we want to get to a point where we're able to push through the middle of the basketball. So what I mean by that is if I have my hand here right now, I have my elbow, forearm, wrist, fingers all lined up, right? So if I was uh, just flatten my hand out here, you see everything is pretty much in a straight line. And if I was to run this up the middle, I'm probably going to be around split, either index or middle finger, right? Does it matter if the index finger or the middle finger is the last finger to touch the ball? I'm going to say as long as it's one of the two, we're going to be all right. right? Don't go crazy over making sure that it has to be the index every time or it has to be the middle finger every time. We're not robots. And there's going to be times where that ball is even going to come off of your ring finger. But where grip mat is going to matter most is when we get to this point where our hand is underneath the basketball and we're in a position to now push through the middle of the basketball. If my hand was here, or I was in this position, but I'm in this, I had this, this little slight rotation, I'm no longer in position to push through the middle of the ball if you were my intended target. I'm going to start pushing that ball off center, right? So even if my index and middle finger are the last two fingers to leave the basketball, in this case scenario of me pushing this way, me keeping everything online with my target is going to be problematic. So where grip really matters, is where we get to what I'll talk about in a bit called our two position. Getting to this two and in a position where we're stacked, wrist, forearm, elbow, shoulder, everything in a pretty good align here. Now there's gonna be some variation too. Take, take this with a grain of salt because everything is an approximation of sorts. My body type is different than your body type. But what we wanna do is we wanna take these principles and be able to apply them to who we are. It's kind of a, a know the rules to break the rules type of scenario, right? You need to know the rules, know the why, and then you can start to mold that to who you are individually. But get to this point, grip is going to matter most when we're here in this position so we can push through the middle of the basketball. Now, when that ball is in our hands, right? Fingers spread, but spring, fingers not spread to the point where we're trying to overextend them, right? We don't want that grip to be crazy on the basketball. The harder the grip, the harder it is going to be to control. Right, so instead, finger spread, I still have control here of the basketball. The whole idea of the space thing, you need a gap. You don't need a gap. If there's a gap there, fine. If there's not a gap there, fine. If I'm able to control this basketball like this and there's no movement, I'm going to be okay. Now, I understand that some of us, smaller hands, that is what it is. But at the same time, we can still find some capacity of control here in which that basketball is not just moving around. I believe that historically the whole gap versus no gap debate came about because somebody was teaching to campers and needed a way to visually represent, okay, this is, this is what I, this is why, this is what we don't want to do. We don't want the ball up here. And we also don't want that ball down here. And then you see, if I do this, my fingertips are completely off the ball, right? But they found a way to find a happy medium. And that's where I, that's where my, my hypothesis is that that's where kind of the gap argument was born. Okay, but gap, no gap, control. Control is what we need at the end of the day. And that more so happens with our finger pads. And so long as we have that ball on our finger pads, and then we're in position to then push through the middle of the basketball, we're going to be okay. All right, so where you start the basketball, I know like uh, a big thing was finding the air hole, lining up our hands here, index, middle. All of that is for nothing if we don't return back to this place. The ball is a sphere. Right, so no matter where I touch this basketball, I'm in the middle of the basketball each time I get to my two position because I'm going to keep bringing it to the same place, right? So this is where our grip really, really matters. If I did a split type grip thing here and then I pulled this ball to this direction or up, up to my two here, again, if I remove that basketball, I'm not in a position to push through the middle of the ball. How I grip the ball here in this, original, in this original capacity, it, it has no bearing on what I'm going to be able to do or how straight I'm going to be able to shoot the ball, which is kind of the name of the game at the end of the day. All right. So that's one of the big things that I wanted to kind of get out of the way before we start to, to really get into the mechanics of, of shooting the basketball. Uh, I believe that energy is the number one component of being able to, to actually get the ball to where we want it to go. If we can't create repeatable energy, we're gonna be at a disadvantage no matter what, right? But before we can even do that, we have to put our body in the right spot. We have to be able to position our body in a way that the ball can move up it freely, 
yet we can produce the most power possible that our body can, can produce. All right. So the beginning stage of this, and this is why I tell all my, my, my campers or, or anybody at my clinics or any player that I work with, with one-on-one, is just learning to get out of our own way. This is a huge, huge piece of, of everything that we do. If we're in our own way, meaning the ball is not able to take the most direct and efficient path possible through the shot, then things are going to start to be more difficult than they have to be, right? So when I say, what does this mean when I say get out of our own way? So let's remove the basketball for a second. And all we're going to do is just start to get ourselves into a position where we're going to be able to move this ball along the line, along the path that we want it to move on. First thing I have everybody do is just stand up as tall as you can stand. And I want you to notice that when I stand up tall, my feet are always fully connected to the ground. When I stand up tall, I don't go up on my toes and I don't sit my weight back on my heels. But I have the weight evenly distributed between the arches of my feet. My chest is up, my chin's up, and I can just stand up as tall as I can be, weight just completely evenly distributed on my two feet, right? This right here is what we want, this feeling, this almost feeling of like a, a weightlessness, if you really stand here like this, is what we want to try to feel once we start to get into our shooting position or our shooting posture, right? I don't want to drop down and drop my chest here because now my weight's forward and I can feel the weight big time on the balls of my feet. Conversely, I don't want to just sit my weight back this way with my, my back too straight up and down because now I can feel the weight just on, the, on my heels, right? What I want to do is I want to take where I'm at here from a high position. I'm going to sink my hips back, but I'm going to do so with the intention of still keeping the weight evenly distributed uh, among, or between the arches of my feet. So I'm here, and then I would just sit back to this position here, right? So I'm still trying to hold this, this position. And this is something that shouldn't feel that uncomfortable, right? It's not like I'm doing a wall sit. So I remember doing wall sits when I was in fifth grade at Holy Name, uh, sitting there, my legs burning. It's just drop and then just find this, this level of comfort here where you could, you could hang out here all day. And the more you can start to find this, the better off you're going to be in being able to take advantage of how we're going to move the ball. If my chest is down, this is what I mean by us being able to get our body out of the way. If my chest is down and I have this basketball here, the first thing that's going to occur is that I'm going to have to pull back. And since my body's going backwards, I'm now creating energy going the opposite way of my intended target, right? And if I'm creating energy going backwards, that means in some capacity, I'm going to have to make up for it to go forwards. And this is where a lot of uh, uh, pulls come into play. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit as we start to talk about how the ball moves up the body. But I want to get away from the ball or from my body being down and then just move it up so that the path that I can start to take here is super efficient and my body's not getting in the way at all. I'm just going to be able to move this ball up my body and everything else can stay as still as possible for the initial point or the initial time that that ball starts to move, right? That's number one. If we can get our body out of the way, huge. Such, such a big piece of what we're going to be able to do in terms of being able to maximize the power and the leverage that we're able to create, right? So high, feet connected to the ground, we drop our hips back, we keep that chest up, our chin up, our eyes up, huge shout out to Rob Fodor, and this way we're gonna be in position to move this ball up our body and give it the head start that it's eventually going to need in order to take advantage of leverage, okay? Uh, as it retains to the feet in this situation, I'm a, I'm a, whether you're 10 toes to the rim or whether you have a slight tilt, my only thing is that our toes are pointed in the same direction. We don't want any type of energy leaks going on here. Um, and what I mean by that too, and, and real quick, is when I'm dropping my levels here, it's something, a, a term that I've been throwing around with a lot of my players is staying stacked, right? And what I mean by that is, I'm in a really good position and strong position um, to be able to then drive through that floor on balance from start to finish. Whereas if I have one foot that goes out this way, I'm no longer in the same stack position. Um, if my knees go inwards this way, I'm no longer in a strong stack position. So we wanna make sure that everything's stacked up over, over each other, shoulders all the way down to the floor, 
and then I'm able to drive up through that basketball eventually. So the more stacked we can be with our balance, the better off we are going to be, all right? Body out of the way, number one. Set your level, set your posture, level meaning dropping our hips back. If we can get that right, we're, we're on the road to doing things much more efficiently than you previ previously were. Now, what becomes more difficult, and we'll probably do a, a whole encore lesson with this kind of stuff, is as movement is added, being able to maintain that posture becomes more and more difficult. And there's situations where you're not going to be able to, but the faster you can return back to that posture, posture up, if you will, uh, the better off you'll be in being able to move the basketball in a repeatable way, okay? So the second thing that we're gonna talk about is what my man Rob Fodor calls connection. Um, I like to just refer to this connection as, as pulling the string. Now this is a debated topic for a lot of people. Um, I get tagged in videos all the time and I don't respond to them for the, for the fact of, um, I think that this is a better way of doing it. And I hope that this explanation makes a bit more sense. So when I say pull the string, I drop to my level, I have my posture, feet connected to the ground. If this ball was out here, right, I'm gonna pull the string feeling, thinking that like I have strings attached to my elbows. Somebody has a string attached to my right elbow, my left elbow, and they're standing behind me, and they pull that string and they bring that ball in nice and connected to my body, okay? What this is going to do is going to allow us to form the most perfect geometric arc that we can, all right? The further away this ball is, I'm not saying you can't make shots this way, but if you just think of it in terms of this ball going in pretend basket this way, the most efficient way to get it to the basket to begin with would be if I had this ball here and I just threw a chest pass kind of just upwards towards the rim, right? It would have no chance of going in, but it'd be the most direct route possible for that ball to take. So if I were to then say, well, the ball has to go up in order to have a chance to go in, then what am I going to do? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take a nice arc over that straight line that I otherwise would have, dr would have drawn to the rim. And by, in order to do that, I need to ensure that this ball is taking the straightest path possible up until my point of release, right? If that ball were to start out here, I would have to pull the ball backwards and then eventually it's going to have to go forwards again. And if that ball goes backwards here, any energy that I could produce on this upswing kind of just gets forgotten, right? And we don't want to, we don't, we don't want to lose any of the potential energy that we're able to create. A lot of us, especially learning how to shoot, again, everything comes back to being able to have that power and create that energy. So let's try to make things as efficient as possible when it comes to how we move the basketball. Now, when I say bring that ball in, in the beginning stages, I will have players over-exaggerate this depending on where they're at in their journey, right? And we're all at different stages. I think that's one of the important things. I'm asked a lot, hey, how long, if I implement this stuff, how long is this going to take? And my answer is always, I don't know. Because we're all at such different places in our basketball journeys. We're all different athletically, uh, our experience, all that kind of stuff comes into play. So initially, I like to have that ball super connected. And what I do when I connect here is that I create this angle from my shoulder to my elbow, to my wrist, right? And which is then going to repeat as I move this ball up to what we call our two position, all right? So this angle here, I said a good rule of thumb generally is our forearm being parallel or just a bit higher in this position, right? And this way, when I start to move the ball in what I call a push, I can start to create power on the upswing to here. Notice as, just because this ball is close to my body, my body still doesn't have to move, right? I'm moving this, I'm moving up. Everything else is staying super still and my angle maintains all the way through. Hand loaded just a bit because if my hand's loaded here, the faster I'm going to get under the basketball, the quicker the release, the less direction change in the shot. Just like I don't want to have that ball way out here because of the direction change that would take place moving backwards. I don't want to have my wrist on top here because of the direction change and almost that pool-like motion here that would take place at the top. So even if I maintained the angle and I drove up, I'd have to lay or load later at the top. And the later the load at the top, the more variability there is. So try to take out as much movement as you can as early as you can. Right? I tell a lot of my players, make shots 
before you shoot them, right? That's one of the big things here. So high, drop, level set, chest up, chin up. I pull that string back. I create my angle, shoulder to elbow, forearm, wrist loaded. And now I'm in position to move that ball along that geometric arc that I want to move it on. Think of it like a half of a McDonald's arch, right? And the more I can think or visualize about, visualize moving that ball on that arc, the less movement, the less direction change there's going to be. There's a lot of misconception about this when I say move the ball in a straight line because examples will be given saying, well, this player moves the ball backwards. We can all visualize what a straight line is. I can visualize, if I'm sitting on, standing on a court, I can visualize that path, that drawn arc, and the ball taking that path from start to finish. I can see that in my head. I know what that looks like. Does that mean that that ball is actually taking that perfect path every time? No. But if my mind is on eliminating as much movement as possible, I'm now setting myself up to shoot a much more efficient shot from start to finish. And so long as that I'm moving the ball the right way, then, I'm, then I, more good things are going to come than not. And that's, 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 that's the goal at the end of the day. Everything is more so an approximation. Again, it's principles versus just, just following one, or find the principle, right? And then again, break it as you start to understand it more and more as it, as it molds to who you are, all right? So ball connected. Now I'm in this position to move this ball up from what we call our one position to our two position, right? And then starting to be able to take advantage of the energy that's created on this upswing. When this ball moves up, we do not want to collapse this angle backwards. When this ball moves up, we want to think about this ball staying in front of our face from start to finish. Again, if that ball, if this angle comes up, if I move this ball and my angle collapses backwards, that's a direction change there. The more direction change and the more movement at the top of the shot, just to, like if I were to uh, collapse my wrist back at the top, the more problematic that's going to be when things start to move faster and faster, right? So hold the angle and keep everything moving in front of you. One of the first exercises that we do with players are just called ball raises. And it's just about starting to move this basketball while everything else stands still or stays still to start to get us used to where we'll be most powerful when we start to flow, th flow through things in terms of where our hips are and where our upper body is, right? So I'm just one, two, one, two. I call this a push and I would call this a pull. Push, angle wrist loaded, angle maintains. Pull, I have to create the angle at the two. And if I have to create the angle later in the shot, that's the direction change. That's where things can get a little bit hairy in terms of being able to repeat under more and more difficult situations. There are always exceptions. I know some people are gonna stay, sit at home right now and say, well, this player does that. Sometimes exceptions help make the rule, right? If there's only one or two players that you're thinking, wow, that's a real high level shooter that pulls that ball. Well, then we have a, we have a pretty good idea that us being able to push that ball through the shot um, in terms of how that ball initially moves up the body is much more efficient at the end of the day. At the same time, while I understand that maybe there's not tons of shooters that do it this same exact way, it's always been a goal of mine to help create what hasn't been versus what already is. And I do see, uh, and being able to work now with thousands of players individually, both in person and then through my online subscription service, that this has been something that has allowed players to see some amazing, amazing results um, over the past few years. So everything that I do and everything that I teach is always backed by what I'm seeing with my players and what the results that they are getting. I can't speak for players that I don't work with. I can only say what works for the players that give me feedback each and every day. I mentioned that Rob Fodor is one of my biggest teachers. My second biggest teacher would just be every player that I've ever worked with because you can't, you can't fake the funk when you're in front of a player. If, if they're not seeing results, that's your fault. And if they're not understanding anything, that's your fault too. So being able to, to get that direct feedback in one-on-one -on -one scenarios has been crucial in, uh, in allowing me to start to piece things together in a way that makes more sense and allows people to start to apply things better and better, okay? So that's our connection piece. Push, do not pull. The more we can push, the more we can start to create 
advantage of the energy that we're going to be creating, okay? Now, the last little piece of this is then just going to be what I'm now calling break the string, right? So we pulled the string initially, and that ball came in nice and connected to our body. Breaking the string is probably one of the most difficult things for players to do. From a young age, when we pick up a basketball, we all like to run to that three-point line, and we put that ball on our hip, and we just chuck it up there with everything that we have, right? And I get, it makes sense. We, we're watching Steph. Um, we're watching all these amazing shooters. We want to do the same thing, we're, whether we're kids, whether we're a little bit older. But what's happening is that does not allow us to take advantage of how we create leverage and power best. So what do I mean by break the string? Well, first, why does the ball actually have to lead the way like we did on our raise? Well, it leads the way because one, we create the energy that's being, we, we, we create energy on the way to the two. So I'm creating energy as this ball starts to move up. And then as I get to this point, in terms of where I'm most powerful from, from a lever and a leverage standpoint, at my, this angle here, and then my hips coming under, that ball has a good amount of distance to travel, right? That ball needs to, from the one to the two, I mean, we're traveling about this far. Whereas when my hips come up, my hips are probably traveling about this far. So if that ball is traveling two to three times the distance that our hips are, in order to be able to take advantage of the leverage, that ball's going to need a head start. Ball moves first and ball moves fast. You can, you can almost slow down any great shooter and you'll be able to see this. What may look like a one motion shot or things happening all at once, there are still individual components within that shot that allow them to take advantage of the leverage that's being created. You don't see any high level shooter doing this, right? Nothing, nothing just moves at the same time. They would never get to a point where they actually get underneath the ball in a way to lift it, okay? So this concept is just what I call breaking the string. When we're at our one, we wanna pretend that there's a string attached from the ball to our chest. And the only way that we can break this string and get this ball moving is by detaching it from our body, right? Detach it on the push to the two. If, my, if I start to move my chest and the ball at the same time, that string would just stay intact. But if I detach the string, I can break the string. Now that ball starts to move up to this point where my hand gets under the ball, which then means my body is underneath the basketball. I'm then able to attach underneath it and I'm able to flow through taking advantage of my points of leverage, right? So if you can, if you can really connect to this concept, this is going to be huge in your ability to start to create the power and the consistency that you're looking for. Now, it, it takes time, it takes a real effort uh, and, a, and a real deliberate focus to be able to do it. But what I'll do here is I'll just break down a, a quick three-step process that kind of allows us to gradually work our way through it. And I do this with all of my players early on that struggle with this particular sequence. But in the very beginning stages, I'll have each player get to their one, push to the two, break the string, and I'll have them hold here before I will then say through, which then means from this position, we're pushing up hips, arms, same time, and pushing through to our target. Very important that once we get to here, we've done our job in terms of the lever, the lever and the leverage that we have. We do not, once my hips come up, want to bring this ball up to this point. As players start to raise up, they come out of this angle, but they come out of it high. And there's a point of diminishing returns in terms of having a higher release and that the more extended I get over top of my head, the less power I actually have. And a lot of times what will happen is you'll see players get to here, they'll push through and it comes almost this like hook type motion. And with that hook type motion, we're gonna see a flatter basketball and players really struggle to get range. There's direction change there at the top. You'll see that as I come up, and as I lift this way, that ball's gonna to start to come over my head, which then means I'm in, that, and I'm in a position more to throw than I am to shoot. Again, the ball should stay in front from start to finish. So if I'm at one, push, break the string, two, and then when I go through, everything is going now towards our target, right? Hand under the ball generally means that body's under the ball, right? So if I'm here, from this point forward, the rest of my body's under it. And now I have all the power in the world, once you start really moving through this,
to really start to get that ball moving. Now, that position is going to vary depending on your distance from the basket, right? Principles are going to be the same. Ball's still going to move first, but the further away I am, the lower that release probably will be, or the quicker that release will be. It's a good way to think about it. But the closer I am, maybe the higher I can get away with, okay? So there's always going to be some type of variance. Again, follow the principles and then mold that to the situation that you're in. Time and situation plays such a big role in being able to shoot the basketball. But if you're not, if you don't understand the principles to begin with, then you may be fighting an uphill battle as you start to make those changes, you start to shoot from further away, all that kind of stuff, okay? So back to our, our kind of three-step process here. Initially, I'll have the player here. I'll push to that two. I'll have the player hold. And then when we push through, notice I still have full foot on the ground. When I push through, I'm going to push through and I'm going to have them hold that finish and then come back down. We're going to do it again. But each time we're going to stop really, really long, really deliberate at this position to get the feel of the correct sequence, right? So the initial stages would just be this one, two, through, one, two, through. Each time that ball's trying, we're trying to get that ball to take the, uh, the path of least resistance to the two. So I got that nice push there. I'm maintaining my angle to the two. And when I push through, all of my energy is going up and towards our target. After the player starts to get a hang of that, what we'll do is we'll just lessen the stop time at the two. I've even used in the past like crazy stuff. I used, I've used metronomes um, instead of me calling it out, but the player would listen to the metronome in terms of going through the one, two, through. But we would go from one, two, through. One, two, through, right? So we start to now pick up the pace. When I'm with a group of kids, I always say initially when we do the first one, two, through with a hard stop, I'll ask, is this a one motion shot or is this a two motion shot? And everybody will respond. Everybody say, well, it's a two motion shot. It's a two motion shot. And then when I get to the last progression of when I start to speed things up, which I'm going to show you, I said, now, what is this? Is this a one motion shot or is this a two motion shot? And then every kid says, it's a one motion shot. And I say, it all just matters how you move through these certain points, right? You have to understand these individual points in time before you're actually going to be able to move through them, right? It's, it's, it's like anything. I've said so many times, Sequence is just so important. How I'm relaying this message to you and the way I'm putting my words together makes sense uh, only because I know what each word individually means, right? If I didn't know what each word meant, I would never be able to make a coherent sentence and, and what I'm saying would, wouldn't make any sense, right? It's the same idea in terms of shooting, right? Our sequence and how we start to put, the, put things together really matter from a sense of I have to understand one, Ball moves first, two, body stays still, and then everything else attaches underneath it. And once I start to understand those individual points in time, I'm now going to be on track to start to move through them faster and faster. The last of that progression before it's just a complete one motion looking or everything moving together looking shot is going in slow motion. So close to the basket, one, two, slow to the two and then through not letting the ball stop moving. So the way to think about this is set the level, set the angle. And now when the ball starts moving to the two, hold that angle. And once that elbow either gets in line straight in front of you, so this part of your arm parallel to the floor or elbow almost to the rim, that is our signal that our legs attach underneath it and we can flow through. And it's something, that you, it's something that I believe should be done initially, slow, uh, slow, steady, and really feel what you're doing before you eventually get to that place where you can just continue to keep that ball moving from start to finish. So without a basketball, without the risk of hitting the ceiling, slow motion, one, two, elbow to the target, now my legs come under, through. And eventually we get to this place where we can just go one, two, through. One, two, through. One, two, through, right? And it's, it's in theory, a, a really, really simple thing. But depending on the habits that you've established, it can be one of those things that can be, in the beginning, a constant struggle. And if you're not deliberate about it, uh, if you're not deliberate about it, and you're not mindful about it, it can be a, it can be a real, 
It can be a real test of how bad you truly want it, right? So hopefully this beginning stage and this kind of, this kind of bare bones but necessary little spiel here will set some of you on your way in terms of just what needs to be mastered before you can do everything else. And I know it may seem overly simple, but I promise you, as you start to do it, you will start to discover things about the shot that you've never felt before, right? And it's a constant process, right? There are only so many great shooters out there because of the time and the attention to detail that it actually takes. It's not something that you're going to start to be able to just implement and then do overnight, you're set, you're good. It never ends. There's a reason why guys like Steph Curry and Klay Thompson are still in the gym, right? Still the best that have done it, but they're still in the gym and they're still working at it every single day, right? There's always something to learn. This is not a, a get rich quick scheme for you in terms of shooting jump shots. Anything that's selling you quick tips to improve your jump shot, it's just not going to work. It's just, it's just not going to work. And I think that if you talk to the guys at the highest level and you asked, hey, what are your quick tips that got you to where you, where you are? Um, I think that they would, they would find that question fairly amusing considering how hard everybody at the top and everybody that we look up to, uh, how hard they work and how much time that they put in. So I hope you find this valuable. Uh, I, this is the beginning stages of a, a series that we're gonna start to do here. But this, this right here, if you do it every day, I promise you, and as you start to smooth it out, you're going to see some amazing, amazing results in what you're able to do. So thank you for listening. Uh, until next time, keep shooting, and I hope that you enjoyed my at-home shooting clinic.